Good morning. Welcome to the service of worship at First Presbyterian Church. We're delighted to have you all with us. Uh, if you are a guest visiting with us this morning, you are most welcome. We ask that you would see an usher on your way out because we have a special gift just for you. And we ask that everyone would sign the friendship registers located in the pews next to you uh, and pass them along. Um, get to know your neighbors by name if you don't know them already. Um, there's lots of announcements in the bulletin. I'm just going to highlight a few. Uh, today we, is World Communion Sunday. Uh, we are collecting our peacemaking offering. This is a national offering of our denomination. Um, it goes towards peacemaking efforts. 25% is up to us to determine um, where it goes, and we have selected the International Justice Mission um, that does work in human trafficking um, and justice issues in 20-plus uh, communities around the world. We raised over $800 for the International Justice Mission last Sunday with the footprints that you all contributed to. So wonderful work of that organization. Uh, the, the offering envelopes for that offering should be in front of you in the pews, and that's taken during our regular offering time. Uh, later on in the service, it's not listed in your bulletin, but following the sermon, we're going to commission our McAllen mission team. Um, information about their trip uh, is in the bulletin, um, and you'll see uh, some of the members of that team this morning, um, and we will pray over them and over the gifts that they are taking with them, um, and pray for them. I would encourage you to pray for them while they are gone. They're leaving um, on Saturday. And then one quick note, you'll notice in the bulletin that we are beginning our, the work, uh, the nominating committee is beginning their work of identifying spiritual leaders uh, for our church to serve um, in the coming uh, three years, those three-year terms. Uh, if you have an idea of someone you think would be a perfect elder for our church, we ask you to submit their names uh, for nomination. Um, information about that is in your bulletin, and you can email Be Becky Bush if you have more questions about that. I'm going to invite up, we've got two minutes for mission, and they're going to be real fast. So I'll invite up Brian. Why don't you come up here? Uh, Brian is speaking on behalf of Men on a Mission, um, which is coming up first Saturday in November. Oh, she already took half of my speech. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. I am here for Men on a Mission, which will be on Saturday, November 5th, which is the first Saturday in November. Uh, this year's recipient is going to be the Highland Food Pantry, which was also last year's. Uh, it is a very good organization, and a lot of people here with First Pres are involved with that organization. Now, first, I got two messages, but first is for you to buy tickets to the event, which they're being sold out here at the table. Uh, the, they're here today and probably the next few weeks. You can purchase them there. But the second one, the most important, is for the men of the church. In order for this to be a success, we need 30 chefs, and I am in charge of recruiting the chefs. Right now, we have about 15 on the board, but I need 15 more good men to step up and make this event a success. All you have to do is fill out this little piece of paper, give yourself a really cool chef name, uh, and just show up with the food on that day. It's a night of food, fun, and fantastic festivities. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. If you have any questions of being a chef, just let me know. I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, and then I'm going to invite up... Um, Dick and Kirsten, these are my parents, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> she said, be very short, and I'm in so much trouble if I'm not, so. <laughs> I'm Kirsten Sonstegard, and this is my husband, Dick Betts, and I have a surprise for you. You are sending us to Ethiopia. <laughs> you probably didn't know that, but on November 3rd, we are going to Ethiopia as your messengers to our two churches in Metu, Ethiopia. We haven't sent anybody since 2010. So we are so honored and excited that you are sending us there. And we are taking gifts from the children, gifts from the arts and faith ministry, two banners. And we want to take messages from you. So there are note cards out in the hall. So you have a chance to write a personal note of encouragement or a prayer to the congregations there because it would mean a lot to them. We even had, when we did the Minute for Ministry this morning at 7.30, there was um, the altar cloth was embroidered by the women of the churches there in Metu. So our connection is very strong, but we want to really send a personal message to them. 
We're going to send messages of encouragement. Um, for the past 20 years, they have grown to the point that they have a hospital, an orphanage, and a seminary. So what can we do other than send words of encouragement? And I was thinking um, in Paul's letter to the Thessal uh, Thessalonians, he was very encouraging. If you look at chapter 1, verse 2, he says, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember for, before our God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Words of encouragement. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Let us continue in our worship of God.
Using your bulletin, let us call each other to worship before the God who waits. Welcome to this place where children and seasoned citizens sit side by side, where heaven and earth embrace in peace, where God has been, is, and always will be. Welcome to this place where all is made ready by our God, where we bring our hunger and find food, where we bring our brokenness and find healing, where we bring our very selves and find acceptance. It is in humility and yet with courage that we come before God to admit the things that bring shame to our minds, the things that we have left undone, and the things that we have done in anger or in selfishness. It is appropriate that we come and we confess our sins unto the God who waits. Let us pray together. We would want to be fountains of hope for others, God of glory, but people find our hardened hearts. We would like to be transformed people, but our stubborn pride prevents us from bending a knee to you. We long to stand with those who are in need, but our selfishness keeps our backs rigid in judgment. Forgive us, God, who came down to us. Humble us that we might be true servants to the broken and lost. Split open our frozen hearts that compassion might flow freely 
to those who are hurting. Fill our minds with the presence of your Spirit, that we might learn how to follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, into that kingdom of grace and hope. And now, God, we ask that you would hear our private confessions as they come from our hearts and our lives. Take from us, Lord, this brokenness that we present to you. For it is in true faith and trust, knowing that you are there with your forgiveness to wipe it all clean. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the good news. In Christ, God's plan for salvation was accomplished. You are forgiven. You are made new. Amen. Please be seated. Any children who are fourth grade and younger, fourth grade and younger, are invited to come forward for the children's message with Todd. Oh. Thinking about uh, when I was your age, and sometimes I would come into the sanctuary, um, and I would notice different things. Um, and so usually, um, when things were different, it meant something different was going to happen that day. Um, so sometimes I would notice that the colors um, on the pulpits would change, or on, the, um, on our table. Um, sometimes I would notice that the baptismal font was pulled in a little bit different place, or maybe that the lid was open. Um, sometimes I would notice um, that there were seats in the front of the church that were reserved. And so I would see these things. And usually, although I should have just said to my parents or to some other growing up and, and maybe asked about what these things meant or what would be happening, um, but I didn't. I usually wouldn't ask a lot of questions. I would encourage you to ask questions. Um, but, but so I would, I, would, I would think of them like clues. And so I would use the clues that I had noticed, and I would try to pay attention to what was happening in the service so that the next time when I saw those same clues, I would know what was going to happen. But there was one thing that I didn't understand. There was a clue that I couldn't figure out. And so in, in the church that I grew up in, Sometimes there was a table, much like this one, um, and it would have a cover on it, and everything was all covered up. And so it's a little bit like that for us, too, um, because we, don't, we know that there's things on this table, 
but we maybe don't know what's inside of them. And so um, in my church, we would go out to We One's Worship, and so I was never around in the service to see what was under that cover, or what was under those, um, those things. Um, well, I guess I figured that what, whatever was under there was not for me. But if I thought that, I was wrong. Um, so as I learned when I got older, under that sheet were the elements for a special meal, a special meal for the people of the church to remember Jesus. There was bread to eat and juice to drink, and it wasn't just for a snack, but it was our chance to celebrate a meal just like the one that Jesus had with his disciples when he told them that every time they ate bread and drank juice, they could remember him, remember that he loved them, and remember that he died so that they could be forgiven. Um, so at this church, we don't say that you have to be a certain age to be part of that special meal. Um, and as your parents and you decide together about um, when it's the right time for you to be able to, to share in the bread and in the juice, you can. Um, but even if you're at We One's Worship, um, or even if you're here but not quite ready um, to, to be part of that special meal, um, you can know that it's for you when you are ready. Um, because it's a meal that's for all people, um, all people who love Jesus. Now, does anyone know what this special meal is called? What is this special meal we're talking about? It's called Holy Communion. And so the clue that you know that it's a communion Sunday is when this table is pulled out um, in the front. And so you know that that's a day that we get to share this special meal together as a church. Um, so when you eat the bread and drink the juice, or even if you're just watching what's happening, make sure it's a time that you can remember Jesus, just like he told us to. All right, so if you would join me in a word of prayer and congregation, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for the special meal to remember you and your love for us. Amen. So you guys have another clue on the front of our bulletin that shows us what this meal's all about. All right, thank you. All right, you guys can go back to your families or out to We One's Worship. Any kids who want to go out to We One's Worship, now is the time. And I invite you to stand and turn and greet your neighbors in the name of Christ.
scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. If you want to read along in your pew, your pew Bible, this is on page 80 in the New Testament portion. Hear now God's word to us. Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must re rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if that same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat and drink, and then later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what is commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves, we have done only what we ought to have done. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I started out on my sabbatical, which um, was about 16 weeks ago, when I started out on my sabbatical, um, I had this idea that if I just had enough time and space to really focus, I could make myself become a more faithful person. If I had time to read more and to pray more and to reflect more and to write more, then I could become more spiritual, more able to be peaceful and less anxious and unsure, stronger, tougher, more able to just love without thinking about it so much. And so perhaps you hear the theme here, more, more, more. This can become the drumbeat of our hearts. We look at our lives and we, we look at the people around us, we look at our, our parents, our children, our friends, and, and we feel like more is needed. We should be more forgiving, we should do more, we should be more loving, less judgy, less critical, less afraid. And then we look beyond that. We look at the world around us and we, we feel like we should do more. There are big problems in the world. There are, there are people who are hungry who need to be fed. There are women and children by the hundreds fleeing violence and streaming across our borders. There are 45 million people enslaved around the world at this very moment. And maybe we, we feel like Jesus always pushes us to do more, to give more, to be more generous, to, to be more, to be less sinner and more saint. Increase our faith. We might feel like crying out. Increase our faith because we do not feel like we have enough. Increase our faith because the task is just too big and overwhelming for us. Increase our faith because because we are facing impossible things. Increase our faith because most days it just feels like we don't have enough to get through our day. And so we stand with those who've been following Jesus all along and, and listening to everything he has to say. And he has told them parable after parable. We have heard those after the, over the past couple weeks. Parable after parable that has completely overturned what they thought faith 
was all about. To be a follower, they first have to go and take care of their family matters because the kingdom of God must be their first priority. To follow Jesus, they have to carry a cross. They will have to put their family allegiances behind them. They will have to give up everything. They'll have to give up all their possessions. Faith is in forgiving and loving, in not being afraid, in taking risks and challenging the status quo. Faith is in thanksgiving, in having confidence in God's justice and being willing to call out to Jesus in our suffering. Luke tells us, shows us, that the people we least expect to have faith are the ones who have it. So the sinful woman who bends down and kisses Jesus' feet, and the blind beggar who just wants to see again, and the Samaritan leper who th comes back and thanks Jesus after he has been healed, and the hemorrhaging woman who reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' cloak, and the Roman centurion who goes to enormous lengths to get Jesus to heal a beloved servant, and Jesus exclaims, not even in Israel have I found such faith. But the disciples, they seem so often to be completely lost, and so when they are, they're in a boat and the storm is raging and Jesus is asleep and they cry out to him, he says, where is your faith? In the text we read this morning, we, we come to the end of a series of teachings. And if you've got your, your NRSV Bi Pew Bible open, you'll notice um, that the NRSV puts a heading on the section that we read today, um, Some Sayings of Jesus, as if this is the stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. Like, like this is the last box you pack when you are moving, and it has like one men's winter glove and two Tupperware lids in it. You know what it's like. This is what happens. But I'm not sure that's fair to Luke. Jesus has been telling them what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be faithful, and what God is really up to in the world. And then he takes it even further in these first couple verses that we read this morning. So if someone else stumbles and sins and struggles and you had some part in that. The burden that you bear is like having a rock hung around your neck while you are trying to swim up for air. This is not about judging that other person's sins. You have got to watch yourself. And then Jesus says, you have to forgive, and if they sin again, you forgive again and again and again. And you might have noticed as we read through the text, that, that while Jesus says all these things to disciples, it is the apostles, so those who are in leadership, those who are closest to Jesus, it's the apostles who cry out, increase our faith. And Jesus' response here is puzzling. So you'll notice first that he doesn't say, because you have asked for more faith, it shall be granted unto you, he doesn't give them anything. And second, I think Jesus sounds annoyed in his response. He says, he says to them something mystifying. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. And so you may be hearing echoes in your mind of that time in Matthew's account of Jesus' life when Jesus says, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. But the disciples aren't moving mountains, and they're not flying trees to the sea. And as a rule, neither are we. So, so does that mean that we have no faith at all? So here's what I think we need to know about what Jesus is saying. We, off, we so often think about our faith as, as something like something that we own. So we can measure it. We can get a bigger, 
better one if we want. And it sort of feels like Jesus is saying something along these lines. When he talks about mustard seeds, it feels like he's talking about measuring out our faith with teaspoons. But what if he's doing something quite different here? So in the Greek, there are different kinds of clauses. Um, and if so, if you're a grammar person, you're going to love this. Um, Jesus is using a very specific one here, a present, real, conditional clause. So instead of hearing, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, which feels like Jesus is saying we don't have even that, instead we should hear it more like, it takes just a minuscule portion of the faith you already have to do things beyond your imagining. So I took a little bit of artistic license there, but that's the feeling of what Jesus is trying to say. So we, we watch Jesus standing in a field, bend down and pick up a tiny fallen seed off the ground um, and place it in his hand and let it roll around in his palm and then show it to the disciples and say, look at this small thing. What if this small thing could make something which seemed impossible possible? What if, what if this small thing could produce a landscape-altering change? What if this small thing could do something that seems at this moment ridiculous? So what we hear from Jesus is that we already have been given everything we need. We don't need more, more. We need eyes to see what we already have. We need eyes to see that it is small things that matter. So when we take um, youth and adults on a mission trip, and Phil has gone with me on one of these trips, when we take, when we take these mission trips, it, it sometimes feel like, feels like we are putting a beautiful Band-Aid on a gaping wound. And we do small things. We, we fix leaking roofs. We get bathrooms working again. We pull out poison ivy in yards where children play. We rebuild the deck. And we do small things, and we wonder if it really matters that we do these things. And Jesus says, even the small things matter. So going to McAllen, Texas, our mission team, going to McAllen, Texas, and giving children who come into our country with nothing, giving them a pillow, a pillow to lay their hands on. Your hands are the ones who have sewn those pillowcases. Making a dish for men on a mission to raise uh, funds for those who are food insecure. Committing to pray for our Ethiopian mission partners and our our mission team going there, repenting, forgiving. Big things begin with a small act of trust. So what I learned on my sabbatical was not how to arrive at some higher plane of spirituality. What I learned was to pay attention to the small things, as the Jesuits say, to, to see God in everything, to notice how meaningful it was to do very small things with great love and to love ordinary things because those are the things that God uses to do the extraordinary things. Amen. We are now going to commission our McAllen mission team, so I'm going to invite um, those members to come forward. We've got some who are out of town, but... And we're going to um, bless uh, the pillowcases that we're sending with them. Some of them. We're sending more than this. Yeah. I pull one. Yeah, we do make some. Let me stand over here. So this is uh, a portion of your mech out. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves or... You don't need to, okay. <laughs> These are the people for you to be praying for for the next two weeks, really, because you guys leave on Saturday. Um, they're going to McAllen, Texas, to a refugee um, center where over 200 refugees are welcomed every day, most of them women with small children. 
um, and they arrive with nothing, no clothes, no food. Um, and so they're gonna go and, and help make that refugee center work for a week um, and bring uh, these pillowcases with them um, to give to children who have nothing so they have a place to lay their head for the first time in a long time. Um, and so we will pray for you um, and bless these pillowcases. So let's pray. Oh God, you say that when we meet the poor and the refugees and the hungry, that we meet Jesus in his most distressing disguise. And so we pray for our mission team going to McAllen, Texas, that they would meet Jesus in his most distress distressing disguise, that they would feed and serve and love and in turn be fed and loved as well. We pray, O oh God, for these pillowcases that they would indeed be a blessing, that they would be our small act of love that goes out into the world, that provides comfort and hope and love and grace to those who need it desperately. We pray for safety, for well-being, and for joy in service. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. Having heard God's word, it is appropriate that we should come now and that we should receive our tithes and offerings. And please know that what you are doing is responding to God's word, not only with all of these mission projects that we are about and the people involved and the ways in which we support them as faith community, but you're also putting in the plate your promise. You're putting in your prayer. You're saying, yes, God, I am yours for this coming week. Let us worship with the gifts of our tithes and our offerings.
Receive these gifts and receive us. Match them together that we might be the ministry of the living Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Friends, today is World Communion Sunday, and we have the table of our Lord before us. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and from west and from north and south to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he offered it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This table that is before us is our Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared.
Please be seated. Won't you join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy Lord, Father Almighty, everlasting God, you have formed the universe in your wisdom and created all things by your power. And you have set us and families on the earth to live with you in faith. We praise you for good gifts of bread and wine, for the table you spread in the world as a sign of your love for all people in Christ. Great and wonderful are your works, Lord God Almighty. Your ways are just and true. With men and women of faith from all times and places, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, for you alone are holy. And so, Holy Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who lived with us, sharing joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was murdered by those he loved. We praise you that he is not dead, but is risen to rule the world, and that he is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate victory with him. Remembering the Lord Jesus, we break bread and share one cup, announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling his resurrection to all peoples and nations. Great God, give your Holy Spirit in the breaking of bread so that we may be drawn together, joined to Christ the Lord, receive new life, and remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. We ask, Lord, that you receive not only the counting of our blessings and our thanksgivings for them and for your presence with us and for this table, but also our supplications as well, as we remember either ourselves or others who are in need and those who are ill in body or in mind or in spirit or in emotion. Please, Lord, come and bring your wholeness. O oh God, you have called us from death to life, and we give ourselves to you and with the church through all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, in the night of his arrest, took the bread. And after he had given thanks to God the Father, he broke it. And he passed it around the table to his disciples. And he said, take and eat this. For this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Come, for all is ready. We ask that you would take the bread and eat as it comes to you, but hold the cup so that we can commune together.
friends, the cup of salvation. Let us now join together in the prayer following communion. Let us pray. Lord, Lord God, God, with thankful, thankful hearts heart. for all your goodness to us, and especially for your nourishment at this table, we offer to you the worship of our lives this week. May we carry out from here your peace and goodwill and joy into the world you love and to the people you love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go now in safety, for you cannot go where God is not. Go now in love, for love alone endures. Go now with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go now in peace, for it is the gift of God to those whose hearts and minds are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.